Okay, thank you. And Jennifer and Diane are both very uh, appreciated from the basis that they are um, key components. As Jennifer said, she is our executive director uh, for Health by Choice Education and Research. And she, and then uh, Diane is our treasurer on the board so that we have them very active in helping, but we really appreciate their help. Tonight I'd like to talk about the gut and the brain. Your gut and your brain are very, very connected. Let me lay my book up here. In making suggestions regarding to foods in general, and I do not diagnose or prescribe, and none of the information offered or accented is to be interpreted or pertaining either directly or indirectly to any disease, condition, or treatment. The information offered is to further public education and to assist individuals to better cooperate with the doctor of their choice in building better health. In the event the information is used without the supervision or approval of a doctor, you may be prescribing for yourself, which is your constitutional right. However, I cannot assume any responsibility. The United States Food and Drug Administration has not evaluated this presentation in terms of its statements and foods spoken of. The information is not intended to replace your conventional medical consultation and treatment. Amen to the FDA. Okay, let's talk about, I have a paper here that if you didn't pick it up, it's a game changers and I'll pass it out in just a moment if you didn't get one. But this whole idea of the gut brain axes in action, you see the picture of the brain, you see the picture of the digestive system down there and we're actually talking about how the gut and the brain connect because these actually, oh, where is your brain? Ah, yes, we do think that it's in our head, but is it really? Where, what's in your heart? Have you ever heard of a person who said, you broke my heart? You hurt me. I have chest pains because you said something very hurtful. Your brain is in your heart. Your, mi your mind, I'm, so I'm sorry, your mind is in your heart. Your brain is in your gut. I'm going to show you how this is actually happening. So if you didn't get one of the game changer strategies, this is a paper then that is telling you about, and this is a lecture that Lee Carroll, who's from Australia, he uh, is a representative for a company called Mediherb, and I got permission to use this little segment as part of a presentation I did a few weeks ago in Pittsburgh for a room full of doctors, because I was teaching about such a thing as how do we go and teach the connection between the brain and the, the heart, the brain and the gut. One of the things that happens is that today, in today's world, so many people use PPI, proton pump inhibitors, antiacids, Tums, whatever. I'm not here to name a brand name. What happens to your gut when you do this? Did you know that you actually are shutting down your own digestive system from functioning? Did you know that when you have acid coming up into the throat, yes, it's not good, that's true, but it's not because you have too much acid usually, it's because you have too little of the right kind. Do you know that by the time you're in your mid-20s, you already are manufacturing less than half of the hydrochloric acid that you should be making? Why? Because we, we cook everything to death. And we go and eat food that's processed so that your body no longer makes the hydrochloric acid. What do you think happens to these animals? Now, I'm not a vet, but I'm told my daughter has a dog that is her child, if you know what I mean. But anyway, she will not give her dog any prepared dog food. Her dog gets raw meat because if you gave the dog, the prepared dog food, 
that dog will not make its own digestive juices and can't digest it because you suppress it by giving it refined food. Do you follow me? Well, we are human beings who also need to have a digestive system that works. So your memory, your cognition, your mood, and your emotion is here as part of this gut-brain axis in action. So let's talk about some of this. So when we look at what's happening with, and we'll talk about yeah, those and these, OK. So that when we talk about the game changers, the importance of gastric acid, we have had the most massive experiment done on human beings that is the most massive experiment on human health, and that is the use of such things as anti-acids. I went and put into this, I pulled the charts because in the first sheet I wrote down the chronic PPI use in adults, and I'm going to come to foods here in a moment, but I need to cover what's happening in the gut and how it affects your whole body. Because it tells you there that the chronic use of these PPI in adults has caused osteoporosis. I don't need to read it to you. You can read it for yourself. But there is actually a factor that's telling you that, it's, that it causes such things as a liver cirrhosis. Wow. What do you mean using something like a proton pump inhibitor, which is prescribed? Did you know that the FDA put a new law into effect October a year ago? that it now is supposed to have a black box warning, you are never to use an anti-acid more than 10 days. Now, I've known people who have used it for years because this is something that is that harmful to the body. OK, so the chronic use of it, and then I have a sheet that shows about what's happening with it. And now we're going to talk about some things of what's happening because we want to talk tonight about some herbs and foods. How do you go and help the brain? Today there are many people who are on SSRIs, that's antidepressants. They had no idea when they started to use that medication that it actually would skew the gut. More about this later. Because most of the uh, we're going to talk about these neurotransmitters that are the natural chemical that your body actually makes. But again, so I say it straight this time, and that is the mind is in the heart. The brain is in the gut. You actually have more neurons in your gut, and I'll come up with specifics here in a minute, you have more neurons in your gut than you do in your brain. So that, in other words, when we talk about how this is affecting the body, let's talk about what this does to the system because it really does have an effect on how this body works. So you have something that the brain's communication systems and the person says, well, I'm just sad. I don't have anything wrong with my digestive system. I'm just depressed. I am uh, just crying every day, or I'm just angry. What are the emotions that go, what part of the body does anger affect most? Where does it affect most? There's a book that is a reference book it's called Metaphysical Anatomy. Metaphysical Anatomy says, your body is talking. Are you listening? This is a book that actually shows you, you can name, it's, page, it's over 700 pages long, so it has a few uh, issues that it can name. Go to the public library, ask to borrow it. If they don't have it, they'll get it for you. Metaphysical anatomy is actually telling you that the person that is walking around itching all the time, they're, oh, I just have allergies. I'm just itching all the time. And I'm madder than a hatter. The liver is saying, help me, help me. 
Your liver is your filter of all your blood. Your liver produces over 5,800 enzymes, and the key mineral that it needs, you heard me say this dozens of times, is, is magnesium. Okay, so in other words, your SSRIs, or these um, antidepressants that are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they actually are meant to cause chemical changes in the brain, but now they're finding out that they don't only make chemical changes in the brain, they actually provoke GI side effects. So that we actually have the person who has an irritable bowel syndrome, for example. And IPS, IBS, is affecting over 2 million Americans, and you have too much serotonin in the gut, and now they're regor regarding this as a mental illness of the second brain. Your second brain, your gut. You've heard of somebody who has a gut feeling about something. They didn't feel it up here, they felt it here. Right at the base of your sternum is what we call the solar plexus. We call it the mentals of the digestive system, the two brains. The two brains is so that we actually have now, science is beginning to understand that we can have psychologists, we can have psychiatrists. I'm not here to say that that's not a, a medical art that's needed, but I'm to, we are now learning that we need to go and go further than that because now we're understanding more about why people act and do the things they do. Something that's fairly common in my office is if I see some kids that a mother will say, now I'm talking about the lower GI tract, you know, if I forget little Johnny's probiotic, and if I forget it more than two days, their personality changes. So their personality changes, but they won't listen to what I'm saying. I'm saying, go hang up your coat. They act as if I never said anything. Why would, there, why would they get so but they wouldn't listen to what the mother is saying. But she goes back and she gives them their probiotics and they're much more amicable. And they're ready to do things like help with the chores. What? You mean the bacteria in your gut could make that much of a difference? Absolutely it does. Absolutely it does. So that when we talk about the central brain, You've heard of somebody who has butterflies in their stomach? Oh, what's butterflies? So in other words, the central brain, the stomach and the sensory nerves are stimulated by a chemical urge. And that's why you can actually feel butterflies when something is, you're scared to go to the dentist. You can't be scared to go to Jeff. But anyway, the thing is this is that, and I wanted to say in the beginning was that uh, yes, I hope you bring your friends to come here, Dr. Hartman, next month. But I was just saying that really his subject is so important. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've seen people and said, do you understand the impact on your health? I'm talking about major impact on your health about your mouth. What's in your mouth? What's going on in the mouth? We'll let him tell you all that. But the point is we need a whole series of lectures on that because it absolutely is that vital and that important. Okay, so I said I'd tell you about the brain. Your brain has 85 billion neurons. Guess how much your gut has? Your brain has 85 billion neurons. Your brain has 100 neurotransmitters and it produces 50% of all dopamine and 5% of serotonin. Now, you've, dopamine and serotonin are something that we know is needed to be in balance in the body. Now, that was just the brain. Let me tell you now about the gut. If you're making a note, this is different. The gut has 500 million neurons. 500 million? There's 40 neurotransmitters identified, and your gut produces over 50% of all dopamine 
and 95% of serotonin. So these many, not all, many of the antidepressants actually create such an overload of the serotonin in the gut that we actually have a mental illness that is coming from the gut. So what happens and why is it that you would crave something sweet? You can't eat a meal without something sweet. You've got to have some sugar. When you go and we're going to talk about these herbs that help the gut to work because it's going to help the brain. But remember that when you eat sweets and when you eat sugar, and where is sugar? In a cup of yogurt that has fruit on the bottom. Where is sugar? In mayonnaise. Where is sugar? Because some people think it's just a candy bar. It's everywhere. But sugar is that poisonous that it actually depletes the bitters in the gut. And it actually affects the body. So if you've not heard of such things as, uh, I want to save the foods to just do the foods together. But if you've not heard of such things as that you want to eat fats, good fats, coconut oil, palm oil, having good things such as, now I'm not saying olive oil. You already know that 60 Minutes last May did a show, an investigative reporting show on olive oil and showed that here in the United States, 80% of all the olive oil that is sold is 62% canola. Canola, and they don't have to tell you on the label because it's under the United States Department of Agriculture. If it's registered there, you do not have to know every ingredient that is in your food. Yes, we need to speak up about that. So 60 Minutes, you've heard of that television show. 60 Minutes did this show and showed that we are using canola, which canola came out of Canada. It comes from the rapeseed. And canola was never made for human consumption. It was made to lubricate farm machinery. But somehow it got into our food supply here in the United States, and it's everywhere. And you don't want to eat it, because it does have an effect on the brain and how it works. OK. Let's go back to how we can have, because what is it that is in your yard right now, in your in your, uh, if you have any lawn at all, what do you see popping up? Dandelion. Dandelion. And I hope that you're not treating your grass to kill those dear things because it's one of the best liver foods you could ever have. Dandelion, the roots, you know, dandelion root tea. You can take the roots and you can roast the roots and make coffee out of it, or a type of coffee. And you can go and take the leaves, and especially if the leaves are fresh and young before the, before, now there is a, a way to make recipes after the yellow flower has come up, but if you get the young plant before the flower comes, it's very tender and you can use it in salads. You can go and use the dandelion leaves to go and make a, when I was a kid, I was in a, a good Mennonite home where you always had bacon fat and you put it across the dandelion leaves and hard-boiled eggs and some vinegar. And yes, mom did add some sugar. But the thing is, this is do it without the sugar today. You'll find that it's really good. Bacon fat? That's horrible, Ella, isn't it? No, it's not. That's why you want to know your farmer. That's why you want to know where your food comes from. Because you don't want ham or bacon that comes from where pigs were fed corn that's genetically modified. Very, very important. Know your farmer. Know where your food comes from. Very, very important. So dandelion. Dandelion is a bitter. There's actually 29 bitters that are known. And dandelion is one of those that is very beneficial to the liver. It's very beneficial to the whole body. When we think of these bitter herbs, and I'm going to talk about a few more, 
the key bitter after dandelion that I want to talk about, which is actually the most important bitter of the evening, is gentian. G-E-N-T-I-A-N. -E if you need pens, up here's pens if somebody needs a pen. OK. So gentian is another herb. It is 400 times more bitter than most other herbs. And gentian is something that should be in any bitter formula. Now, if you were putting some bitters together yourself, you'd always want to, because bitter herbs are cold herbs. And you always put a warm herb with it. It would be like ginger or something like that. But in other words, having bitter receptors. Now, you know that your tongue is a, your tongue actually shows the reflex, the reflection of your major organs of your body. You know that. The tip of your tongue, in the very center, is the end of the aorta to the heart. When somebody sticks their tongue out in front of the mirror and they have this big crevice down the center, they're very B vitamin deficient. So that when you look at the tongue, right down on the very sides, at the very end of the tongue, is the lungs. Then we go to the major organs and they're flipped. So that on my left side would be my right lung. On the left side would be my liver, and over here would be the reflex to the spleen. And then the very back of the tongue, do you ever have somebody stick out their tongue and the back is all coated with white? That's yeast, fungus. That's telling you that their gut is not as healthy as it should be. So now, what else did we learn? Since 2000, we have learned so much about what's happening with such things as bitters. We've learned that the vagus nerve, which we had no idea had, had some connection to your tongue, we often talk about when you eat that you want to chew your food, you know, not like shovel it in quick and get going. You want to chew your food, you want to masticate it and mix it with your saliva because when you do that, you're actually starting your own digestive juices to working. Well, now science has been able to prove that you are able to go and have a uh, bitter that you would put in your mouth, like dandelion, for example, or gentian. We're going to talk about wormwood. We're going to talk about some others quickly. My time's going away. Uh, but in other words, understanding that a bitter you want to taste on your mouth. You can get bitters. There are bitters that are tinctures. Uh, Nutrition Frontiers makes a GI Max. They make a GI Gentle. Uh, Mediherb makes a product that's called Digest Forte, which is awesome. To take a bitter, and to, these are just herbs, to put it on your tongue before you go and start your meal. You will change your whole digestive system, and within a week, you will find out that your body, oh, your brain? Oh, you mean that you started getting motivated? You now wanted to do something like walk? You wanted to do something that would actually help to take care of your health and wellness? Yes, because if you put a bitter on the tongue, you actually will start giving the brain a different message. You gave your gut a different message so that the big thing is, I went and put on your uh, sheet was the next sheet said, bitter receptors are everywhere. They're only in the tongue. Since early 2000, we found that they're in the digestive tract and everywhere. I want to go to the next page. Bitter receptors everywhere. Bitter receptors everywhere. And then it starts telling you the thymus. Your thymus is right here. Your thymus is part of your immune system. We didn't know that there was bitters there. They now found out in science that your immune cells actually emit a bitter. Your immune cells do. So that when we looked at the kidney, your kidneys are hmm, pretty important. That's why you have water. It's number one to drink regularly between meals. Epidermis, that itching that we talked about or that allergy response. Yes, it can have to do with the liver, but it has to do with the bitters on the tongue. You can change allergies 
directly by putting bitters on the tongue before you eat. You actually can change the epidermis, whether it's inside the body or outside the body. Thyroid. Many times thyroid is something that people have taken their temperature underneath their arm and they know how uh, important it is to know what their axillary temp is when they first wake up in the morning. Well, that is important, but the thyroid function is affected by bitters. Vascular smooth muscle, the person that has hypertension or hypotension, these all can be documented. This isn't somebody's thought or idea. The heart, the heart's a muscle. The heart needs to have sufficient magnesium. The heart has to have sufficient potassium. If you don't have enough potassium, magnesium, and calcium, you're going to find out that you will have leg cramps at nighttime. You go into Charlie horses. But you don't want calcium, that is carbonate or some of these anti-acid type calcium, because it's the wrong kind. Urinary tract. We know that women who have a UTI, even once, that you need to go back and check the thyroid function because that makes a difference. But a urinary tract infection is often telling us about the lack of bitters in the gut. Bone marrow, you mean it affects my immune system? Absolutely it does. The immune cells, testes, olfactory cells, so that the essential oils that will be given away as a prize to the winner who buys a ticket for that will go and find out that taking and smelling an essential oil up into your head, up into your nose, actually makes a difference in the whole body. That's why you can use things like Tranquil or Stress Away or many uh, lavender before you go to bed. Just putting a drop and smelling, put a drop maybe of lavender on your pillow because it makes a difference in how the, the uh, immune system works and how the body will rest at nighttime. And lungs. So that this is telling us a lot about this. So dandelion, I told you about dandelion, that it is something, yes, dandelion is a diuretic, so it will make you go to the bathroom. What else is in season right now? If you don't have a farmer's market that's active and you don't have a garden, you should know that this is the time of the year. This is the 20th of April today. This is when asparagus should be picking, OK? And asparagus is what? That's medicine to your kidneys. Asparagus is so vital to have sufficient because it'll flush the kidneys. They'll say, oh, I, if I go to the bathroom, my urine smells. Imagine, what is asparagus rich in? It's rich in arsenic. And you can eat it raw. It's really delicious. You can also steam it if you like. Just don't put it on a charcoal grill. You could use a gas grill, but not charcoal. We'll go into a whole other subject some other time. OK, so I started telling you then about gentian root, because gentian root, I already told you, was 400 times more bitter than any other bitter. And I told you that it is something that certainly stimulates bile secretion. Now, what is it that controls the lower part of your GI tract, the muscle tone, whether you have diarrhea or whether you have constipation? Your gallbladder and your liver. So that a person who doesn't have a gallbladder the old time medical doctors would tell you that you had to go and take some bile salts because your gallbladder isn't there anymore and you need to have some bile salts in order to stimulate because remember that's the soap suds that scrubs the inside of the intestine. And so you need to have, gentian is something that stimulates bile secretion so that the person who is not having sufficient of, because what is normal? You don't like to talk about it, but it's really important that you look at your poop. If you don't, you should. The old time toilets that had more water in them would actually show whether the poop floated or not. Well, that's an important factor, because if it floats, it means that you digested your food and all you're getting rid of is the fiber that your body didn't need. It shouldn't smell up the room. You shouldn't have to get candles out. Because if you are, that means that the gut is fermenting and decaying the food and you're not processing properly. And that takes us back up to the mouth because this is where digestion begins. Okay? So 
Now, what else about poop? You should be going three times a day for every meal that you eat. It should be 16 to 18 inches long without getting out your tape measure. <laughs> and you always go to the bathroom, and when you're going to have your bowels to move, you are going to sit, because we're American people, we sit in a chair-like position to go to the bathroom, which is the most unnatural way to eliminate. Because you should be having a stool so that you are putting your knees higher than your hips. Because you're at a squatting position, you'll find out that the body works a whole lot better. Now, what else? It should be medium to dark brown. Because if it's not medium to dark brown, that means you don't have enough bile coming through from the gallbladder. Yes, some people say, oh, I had to have my gallbladder removed because I had stones. Oh, what about the stones that are in your liver? Oh, I don't know. I don't have stones in my liver. Whoa, wait a minute. There is such a thing. And there is ways in which you need to help that liver to work better. Next herb. How long do I have? 7.45. 7.45. OK, I've got to hurry faster. OK. <laughs> Wormwood. Wormwood is the next herb I'd like to talk about. And the thing is this, is that so many people, if you had more bitters in your, in your foods, you would actually find out that you wouldn't have so many problems with parasites. Parasites is such a big, big subject. Some night we have to spend a night just on that because I don't know of another single thing that will change personalities and change people's way of thinking. The person who is an absolute grouch a lot of the time frequently has worms. Now, we do have good worms and we have bad ones. There's many things that you can use, but I already told you some. I told you about gentian root, and I told you about wormwood. Fennel seed is another one that's good, but wormwood and gentian are two herbs that help to get rid of parasites. I tell mothers that, you know, first of all, let's go back to the vet again. Veterinarians will tell you that your animal, your pet, that you have in your house, that you allow on your bed, should be wormed at least every three months. What do you think you do? Your body needs to be wormed as well. I don't know if it's every three months, but certainly spring and fall for sure, because worming the body is an absolutely important factor. We can use such things as uh, I wanted to show you, because sometimes it sounds, this is a book. It's called The Principles and Practice of Phytotherapy. We're the only country in the world that uses herbs, and we call it herbology, <coughs> excuse me, or herbs. This is a, um, what we call modern herbal medicine. Phytotherapy is, this is actually a book that would be equal to a PDR, a physician's desk reference of drugs, OK? This is a book that is actually used in Kerry Bone is one of the uh, co-authors of this. He's from Australia, and he has a uh, graduate program that he has at the university that he's in charge of, and that teaches about phytotherapy, because phytotherapy is something that is very, very medicinal. Do you know that you live in the country, you live in the United States, where there is no law to protect you that you actually know whether the herbs have sufficient, uh, in other words, that it's actually a medicinal dose in one tablet. Because most people are taking handfuls of herbs. They have no idea if it's actually the right part of the herb, whether it's enough of a concentration to actually make a difference. I'm not here to say that herbs don't work at different levels, but there's a big difference into what is a medicinal herb and what isn't. This is another book. It's called The Essential Guide to Herbal Safety. This is not about a brand name. Neither one of these are. This is about herbs as a whole, because many people don't treat them like medicine, and they need to be treated as medicine, because they can be something that is very, very helpful to the body. This is also edited by Simon Mills and Carrie Bone. But learn to know that these things do make a difference. Okay. When we think they made a discovery and they found out that wormwood and gentian 
and feverfew. That these three herbs, feverfew, you heard of feverfew before, I hope? <coughs> feverfew is the only herb that has ever had documentation to show that it helps migraine headaches. And if it's used on a regular basis at a medicinal dose, that means one pill of Mediherbs Feverfew, if it's used at a medicinal dose, it actually will make a difference for people that have chronic migraine headaches. Well, they found out that, I told you that there was 29 different bitters. Well, they found out that gentian, wormwood, and Feverfew actually activates 12 of the bitter receptors in the body. That's very important for you to know. Because all allergies, yes, I said all allergies are a lack of the bitter receptors being activated. So that the person who says, have, we do a, at our office, we do a zinc tally test. And so one of the staff will give you some zinc to put in your mouth and you're supposed to hold it for so many seconds and you're supposed to say whether it has a taste or not. You'd be amazed how many people say, didn't taste anything to me. Do you know that the people who don't taste, not just about zinc now, but that don't taste the fine tastes of different flavors and tastes, those people are far more susceptible to disease than the person that is a very quick taster, a good tasting person. Tasting person, yeah, right. But anyway, a super taster is what I'm talking about. So that we know that a person who has, a person who smokes, frequently they don't taste things very quickly because the cigarettes has hampered their taste buds. Okay? So when a person has a lot of dental issues, hmm, they don't taste things very easily. And it actually makes a difference. The person who is diabetic Often what happens to the person that's diabetic is that they have the vagus nerve has been injured because of the diabetes. And now we have that they are not a good taster, but we need to work on how we can change this, and it can be changed. Okay, uh, so gentian, the most common issue, and maybe you've never heard of this problem, called gastroparesis, but it's when people who eat and they just ate a little bit, let's say a half of a sandwich, and they immediately feel bloated, and the food just lays there, and it just ferments. And it's because of a lack of these bitters. Now, I have to talk about foods quick, because I want you to know that the foods that you eat are very, very important. You've heard of this book that has been around for years already called Wheat Belly. Wheat Belly is a book that has been written by a cardiologist from the Midwest. He wrote this book because he was so frustrated with his patients not getting better. And he, write, he wrote the right, he was not into nutrition per se, but he started investigating why were his patients not responding. He found out that this was the biggest thing, wheat. And so he wrote the book Wheat Belly. On the back of the uh, book, it says, did you know that eating two slices of whole wheat bread can increase your blood sugar more than two teaspoons of sugar? Whole wheat bread, that's supposed to be good for you. Oh, I don't know about that. So along comes a couple years later, somebody called, and I hope to bring these kind of people here to speak sometime, because we need to, and that's why we encourage you to tell your friends and neighbors about these sessions here because we're trying to go and make a time that we can teach you more about helping yourself. Grain brain, <clears throat> Perlmutter, neurosurgeon, brain surgeon. Perlmutter wrote the book Grain Brain and it says here the surprising truth about wheat, carbs and sugar, your brain's silent killers. Whatever happened, I thought wheat was good. 40 years ago when I started doing nutrition counseling, I told people, I certainly go get a loaf of whole wheat bread. That'd be wonderful. I wouldn't do that today for anything. What's wrong with wheat? Well, we did something called hybrid it. We did something called we hybrid the wheat. We, we now uh, spray glycophosphate on it. 
That's what the farmer sprays on the wheat two weeks before they harvest it in order to have all the grains to be harvested at the same exact same uh, perfection of, of uh, ripening. Brain Maker was Perlmutter's next book. He has another book after this one that's on the diet. But this says the power of gut microbes to heal and protect your brain for life. In other words, the bacteria in your, brain, in your body, in your gut, actually helps. I wanted to talk about, this is a book that's been around for years, but Michael Murray's book on healing foods, it's an encyclopedia of healing foods. But I wanted to tell you also, this is one of my current favorites. I read this book last weekend, and <clears throat> it's Dave Ashbury. And Dave Ashbury, this is a brand new book. You'll see it at Barnes & Noble. It's called Head Strong. And by the way, every one of you have marked your calendars for this Saturday, right? Because this Saturday at Barnes & Noble, Jennifer will have her book there, OK? You want to go and see Jennifer and get her book. OK, Head Strong. So Dave Ashbury is this biohacker who for nearly 20 years, he was in his early 20s, and he was wanting to know why his brain went to lunch in the middle of the afternoon. He was tired. He couldn't think. Now, here's a smart guy. Here's a guy who was actually the head of very large companies at different times. And he found out that in order to feed the brain, he found out he was very allergic to mold and mildew. So his favorite drink in the morning was, guess what, coffee. Did you know that the coffee in the United States allows a, a certain amount of mold to be in it? Yes. Not long ago, about a month ago, I'm told that Japan had a shipload of coffee that came that was rejected. So they said, what are you going to do with it? Not a problem. Send it to the States. They buy it. The United States has coffee that permits a level of mold. If you go to a Bulletproof Exec, if you heard about Bulletproof Coffee, it's not just about the coffee that is without, that's been vetted to be without mold and mildew, but also what this man did was he went and traveled to the Himalayas and found out that those people lived to a very old age and they would have a, in the morning when they got up, they had a big mug of tea and put a big spoonful of butter into the tea. Why? Because the butter is what feeds your brain. Your brain needs fat. It needs good fats. You will never get fat on good fats. You've certainly gone on YouTube and saw the medical doctor whose husband couldn't find his way home, and she started feeding him coconut oil every day, and now he's absolutely fine and can find his way home. Your brain needs fats. What is the drug that is destroying the fat in your brain? Statin drugs. Brand new uh, book that just came out less than a month ago showing you that statins don't work. THINCS.org is the website. OK, so Dave Ashbury went and increased his IQ by almost 20 points. Now, this is over a couple years. And he can document it. So you might want to read Headstrong if you're interested. i got to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.